Less than a month after President Obama allowed drilling off the U.S. shores, an oil disaster is looming. Is Obama's hope to get the Republicans on board his carbon emissions bill jeopardizing environmental safety of the U.S. coastline and the future of a thriving tourism industry? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Sahil Rahm and welcome to the programme. It's a race against time as 42,000 gallons of oil pour into the Gulf of Mexico after a drilling platform collapsed last week. As the slick spreads, it's feared that it could damage wildlife. Emergency crews are looking at ingenious ways to seal the well, but as Harry Fawcett reports, it's not easy. The effects of this leak are plain to see, a thin sheen of oil stretching nearly 80 kilometres by 60 at its widest points. The source lies a kilometre and a half straight down, a leaking pipe spurting some 160,000 litres of crude every day into the Gulf of Mexico, its course controlled by weather and currents. We have no shoreline impact at this time, and we continue to work with the Gulf Coast states to ensure the pre-positioning of oil skimmers and boom, so we're prepared to immediately attack any spill if it migrates to shore. As booms are deployed to skim the oil from the sea, underwater robot submarines continue to try to stem the leak at its source, but that effort has so far been unsuccessful. The rig's leaseholder, BP, has brought in a new platform to drill into the well at a different point, something which could take two months. Its parallel plan to deploy an underwater dome to contain the leak, then funnel the oil safely to the surface. We have to complete the engineering and complete the fabrication. If those efforts are successful, we would be able to deploy it and determine if it will work and be successful. So that would be the timeline I would focus you on now. Is it, it, we're still probably looking at, at, at several weeks out, around two weeks out. Eleven workers were killed when the Deepwater Horizon rig exploded last Tuesday. The rig had passed several safety inspections, but some workers' relatives are claiming compensation from BP and its operator, Transocean, over the way they ran the world's deepest oil and gas drilling operation. Most attention now, though, is on the possible environmental impact, with the spill threatening sensitive coastal wetland areas. We're hoping, as most people are, that, you know, the Coast Guard and the companies are able to suck up most of the oil. But, you know, in that regard, uh, even under the best of circumstances, they only get about 40 percent of the oil. I mean, taking a step back from this, the real solution to this is a global climate change and energy bill, which would reduce the need for drilling in places like the Gulf of Mexico. In fact, the rig explosion comes a month after the Obama administration announced plans to expand offshore drilling. The White House says it's focused on the current cleanup. That's our first, that's our, our, our foremost uh, priority at this point is, uh, is doing all that we can uh, to prevent uh, further leaking. It's the priority of all the agencies and companies involved, but one which could take weeks or even months to realise. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera. Over the past three decades, a number of spillage incidents have taken place. Here are just a few of them. In 1979, more than 230 million gallons were spilled in two separate incidents, one off Mexico's coast and the other when two tankers collided off the coast of Trinidad. In 1989, 11 million gallons were spilled into Alaska's Prince William Sound in the much-publicised Exxon Valdez disaster. And in 1991, about 520 million gallons were deliberately released from oil tankers in Iraq during the first Gulf War to impede the US invasion. Well, joining our discussion today are our guests in Washington, D.C., Tyson Slocum, the director of the Public Citizens Energy Program, which advocates for affordable, clean and sustainable energy. In Doha, Todd Kent, professor of U.S. government and political science at Texas A&M University in Qatar. And in London, Mamde Salome, an international oil expert and a consultant for the World Bank there in the British capital. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Uh, Tyson Slocum, can I come to you first? How serious is this event compared to the others we've just mentioned, um, either in the Persian Gulf, the Caribbean or the Middle East? Well, I mean, so far it's not as serious in terms of the amount of oil that's been spilled or has gotten into the uh, marine ecosystem. Uh, we're not sure yet what the extent of the potential damage is going to be, but so far it's fairly isolated. But there's no question that this spill, even though so far it's relatively minor, definitely is going to put a dent in congressional and presidential uh, plans to try to vastly expand offshore uh, oil drilling because I think this underscores that 
uh, drilling for oil offshore, particularly in deep wells, is is never risk free. Yeah, well, uh, whether we'll, we'll, uh, for I'm not the trying to stop here, but we'll certainly workers. we'll certainly come to that part of the, of the conversation just a little bit later. I just want to get your general uh, impressions, uh, Mamdou Salame in, in London. Does your heart sink, sir? when you hear about uh, another oil disaster? You have an expertise in the oil industry. Uh, yes, I get very worried. But in this case, the environmental damage so far is limited. And we hope with the efforts being exerted now, it will remain limited. The danger is that it might reach the coast of Louisiana then the environmental damage will be huge to sea life as well as to the coast of Louisiana. But what is more important is that it will focus the attention of the US authorities and the world authorities as well on the uh, security of uh, exploration at sea. And that will be coming soon, I would say, rather than late. Well, uh, we've heard both from DC and London. Let, let me bring in Todd Kent here in Doha, Qatar. You've heard what our guests have said uh, about their concerns, uh, Todd. Um, let's bring into question this recent announcement, only what, last month, uh, by President Obama to lift the ban on oil exploration. Tyson alluded to upcoming thoughts on climate change and agreements. Why do you think President Obama has done it and done it right now? Well, I think certainly the, the, the timing is unfortunate given the, the recent uh, disaster in the, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico. I think President Obama moved to expand drilling because he needs support for his climate bill. Uh, he needs uh, some legislative victories in the upcoming election in November. And I think this is a way to reach out to some Republicans to maybe bring them on board because it's obvious that some of the coastal state Democrats are not gonna vote for this bill if it expands drilling. But this way he can maybe bring some uh, um, Republicans into the fold. It's, his, it's his really his first attempt since the health care bill to reach out to Republicans and he needs that Republican support to get to get this bill done and, and with the looming elections in November this is a very important legislation for President Obama. Do you think you can really swing a, a climate change agreement uh, by attracting the Republicans on board? Well it takes 60 votes to get a bill out of the Senate he has about 59 votes with Democrats, but we know some of those Democrats are going to peel off if, if the bill has any type of uh, drilling involved, especially offshore drilling. Uh, so he needs some Republicans. Now, see, the Republicans in the past have been advocates for offshore drilling. So this is him actually kind of pressuring them to come back on board and support uh, support his enlargement. Now, uh, he didn't he didn't open offshore drilling entirely, and so that's going to be some of the Republican complaints. But he needs a few Republicans. To, re to replace some Democrats that are, are likely to de uh, defect on this bill. Uh, Tyson Slocum in D.C., does it worry you that uh, oil drilling uh, off the coast of America is being used as a political ball, you might say, to gain perhaps or win the match? Oh, yeah, most certainly. And, and I think the other important uh, game that this offshore drilling announcement by President Obama really means is that it's for positioning and rhetoric to battle with the Republicans in the upcoming midterm election. Democrats are looking at a lot of losses, uh, and I think Obama's announcement was timed to blunt what was expected to be a major uh, advertising push by Republicans attacking Obama's energy policy, particularly because many Wall Street analysts were predicting uh, a barrel of oil to be at 100 or $110 uh, a barrel by July. And so I think that Obama's announcement was more to blunt uh, a projected Republican attacks in the campaign than it was for a climate deal, because as, we, as we're seeing right now, the climate deal is almost completely collapsed. The ability of Republicans and Democrats to come together in the Senate on complex, far-reaching climate and energy legislation is very strained in this election year. And I don't see uh, that uh, this oil drilling announcement is going to successfully result in some grand climate compromise. Yes. Many... Uh, so that said, I, I don't know how how serious this offshore drilling proposal by the president is. I think it's more trying to gain the upper hand in the upcoming elections against the Republican Party. Yeah, many theories as to why he's announced it. Now, let's take a quick look at what Mr. Obama said about offshore drilling. So today we're announcing the expansion of offshore oil and gas exploration. 
but in ways that balance the need to harness domestic energy resources and the need to protect America's natural resources. Under the leadership of Secretary Salazar, we'll employ new technologies that reduce the impact of oil exploration. We'll protect areas that are vital to tourism, the environment, and our national security. And we'll be guided not by political ideology, but by scientific evidence. Though the expansion is limited, the White House says drilling will be allowed off the coast of Virginia and perhaps off the remainder of the Atlantic coast. So what has driven Obama to make this decision? Looking back at the election campaign, reducing U.S. reliance on foreign oil was a key policy goal. Analysts have also argued that Obama has used offshore drilling as a bargaining chip with the Republicans in an attempt to secure their vote in the Senate on crucial climate change proposals. Mamdou Salome, uh, may I come to you in London, sir? Um, Obama's plans to begin drilling or give permission, certainly, is not going to solve the US's energy needs. And that's the big debate, isn't it? It's uh, economy uh, and the use of oil to try and perhaps kick, kick start it. Uh, President Obama's call for the expansion of offshore drilling is very logical. The United States badly needs to uh, increase its oil production. Remember that the Gulf of Mexico currently contributes 25% to U.S. production of 5 million barrels of crude oil. Not only the United States needs the expansion, the uh, global oil market needs the expansion. Currently, 25%, an estimated 25% of crude oil production comes from offshore drilling. That is important at a time when the global demand for oil is increasing, and that is being reflected increasingly in the rise in the oil price. So the uh, offshore oil industry is an integral part to keeping some sort, a semblance of balance between supply and demand. Furthermore, the offshore industry has invested more than $291 billion in the year 2007 in the offshore drilling, and that is projected to increase to $264 billion by the year 2014, four years from now. Well, when we talk about billions of dollars and trillions of this, that and the other, Todd Kent, I mean, really, at the end of the day, isn't it more expensive to actually produce U.S homegrown oil than actually import it from other oil producing countries. No, that's certainly true. But as the oil prices, as Tyson alluded to earlier, begin to increase above $100 a barrel, it becomes more cost effective to go after these deep wells. You know, one thing that hasn't been mentioned here is the Obama expansion of drilling did not include the eastern Gulf region near Florida, which is estimated to have 3.8 billion barrels of oil in there. And so I, I think this is not about increasing oil, uh, world supply. None of this would come on the market, even if it, it's a done deal till 2012, 2014. So this, I think, is, as Tyson alluded to, this is about electoral politics within the United States. But it does contradict what Mr. Obama said as a presidential candidate. Uh, and, and part of his policy there was to continue to say that America needed to reduce its oil dependency on the Middle East, for example. Um, so reopening, you might say, the debate about drilling offshore right. um, makes him seem as he's sort of taking a step back or, or reneging well, on his promises. In August 2008, as a candidate, he mentioned that, that he would like to expand it, and that's what he's done. But he didn't expand it totally. He, he eliminated most of Alaska and the Pacific Coast, some parts north of New Jersey and some parts of the Gulf. So it's a partial expansion. So it's somewhere between what maybe pre former President Bush would have done and, and no expansion. So he's somewhere in the middle. Tyson Slocum, can I bring you in here? It does seem really that you're damned if you drill and you're damned if you don't. Uh, with so many oil disasters historically hitting uh, the globe as such, what has been the long-term environmental impact? Doesn't nature actually look after the seas as well, after perhaps the humans have skimmed off the, the, the major disruption to the surface of the water? Well, I mean, there's no question that our continued dependence on oil is disastrous for the environment, not only 
in localized ways when you've got spills, whether they be tanker accidents, whether they be pipeline accidents, or the type of offshore oil rig accident that we saw here with BP, but also the uh, environmental and climatic disaster that comes from burning oil in gasoline and in automobiles and industrial processes, because that releases uh, uh, dangerous greenhouse gases that uh, if we continue releasing them at the rate that we have been, uh, it's going to lead to catastrophic climate change. And so the best thing for a country like the United States to do, which, you know, remember, we consume one out of every four barrels of oil every day on the planet, we have to become more efficient and use less oil, not continue to explore for more. And that means making our, our automobiles more fuel efficient, finding alternative fuels, uh, maybe like natural gas for uh, trucks and for fleets, uh, and uh, moving more towards mass transit. I think that uh, and then moving uh, towards uh, bridge fuels like electric hybrid vehicles. That's the only way that, that we're going to really successfully address the harmful uh, environmental and climate impacts of our continued oil addiction. Well, let's just give our viewers some background to how dependent the U.S. is on oil imports. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, about 53 percent of the crude oil and petroleum products used in the United States in 2009 came from other countries. In January this year, total crude oil imports averaged at 8.4 million barrels a day. While Canada is the largest exporter, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia and Iraq are some of the top 10 exporters to the U.S. Um, uh, Mamdou uh, Salome, uh, it seems very certain that, for example, House of Representatives uh, Republican uh, leader John Boner questioned why the potential areas for drilling are still off limits and insists that Americans will still ask where are the jobs that come with oil exploration? Um, how would you answer that question uh, for the American public? I would say again that uh, offshore drilling is very important for the security of oil needs in the United States. And I would also suggest that more areas should be open to exploration, especially in the coast of Virginia and near Alaska. But having said that, there should be more care taken to make sure that we control the security of the oil rigs and the safety measures taken to uh, prevent pollution. And if it does happen, which might happen by accident, is limited without a huge damaging environmental impact. But having said that, I again say that offshore exploration, not only very important for the United States uh, oil needs, but it is important around the world for the global oil needs. Whether we like it or not, oil will be with us all through the 21st century. But we have different measures which we can reduce our dependence on it, one of which is that uh, car manufacturers could uh, manufacture cars which make 80 miles a gallon instead of the average 30. The technology exists in the United States as well as in Europe and China. And that should be agreed upon in within two or three years time. That will have a great impact on the global demand for oil. Well, it would. Todd Kent, isn't it also true that as soon as the issue of, of green cars, green energy, cleaner fuels, all raises its head above the political parapet, um, you then have the big oil companies behind the scenes, uh, not just in America, lobbying respective governments to, to quash the idea. It's it, perhaps a little bit of an accusation I'm saying there, but what's your sense of how strong the oil companies are when they're under threat from greener fuels or greener energy? Well, certainly, um, when the price gets high, uh, oil companies know that people begin to seek alternative forms. There are more call for uh, more fuel efficient cars. And we know car manufacturers don't like that because it's more expensive. So it does, so even most of your oil producing nations don't want the oil prices to get too high because it causes people to shift their demand elsewhere. And so certainly, um, um, you know, as, as if we have summer oil prices above $100, where people in the United States begin to travel, there's going to be a lots of, of complaining from consumers, and you're going to hear uh, uh, talk uh, more pressure 
uh, to expand drilling and to, to produce something to bring that price down. So it becomes very political in the United States. Uh, Tyson Slocum, I'm sure you have figures for yourself, but some analysts, and I'm quoting here the Center for American Progress, suggest that drawing the U.S.'s dependency on oil and moving to greener energy environment could create 1.7 million jobs and remove 640 million metric tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. Lots of big numbers there. I'm sure lots of environmentalists have their own figures. Who do you believe? Well, I mean, there's no question that the oil and gas industry employs a lot of people and, and those uh, jobs are relatively high paying. And so uh, any analysis of job creation by shifting to a green economy has to look at the net job creation. That is jobs that are lost from the transition away from oil and gas and the jobs that are gained from uh, from cleaner uh, technology investments. So there's no question that there's a lot of promise in so-called green jobs in terms of uh, energy efficiency in the in the building sector in terms of uh, ramping up alternative fuels and uh, uh, producing more uh, energy efficient vehicles uh, but uh, we do have to be honest and, and recognize that the oil and gas sector is significant that there are large regions of the united states that are heavily dependent on oil production and oil refining and that we've got to be realistic about what cost that uh, will incur from a transition to a cleaner uh, uh, economy. Uh, I'm going to come back to Todd Kent and Mahmoud Salameh here because um, statistics from the Federal Election Commission uh, released in March say that for every one dollar the oil companies gave the Democrats during the election campaign, they gave the Republicans three. So it's inevitable that politicians will always have the final say, but will there be any change to that? Uh, Todd, let me come to you first. Well, I don't think so. I think that uh, the Republicans have stood behind the oil industry and they have supported expanded drilling opportunities onshore and offshore. And that's something the oil companies understand. I think um, the Democratic Party has been uh, pushed for cleaner top energy and, and other, so they haven't been the friend of the oil industry in the past. And let me just say one thing that the oil in, used in the United States, most of it is industrial. And so when you talk about uh, cheaper oil, you're basically helping U.S. industries, and that becomes very important as, e as industries that are heavily oil dependent are going to certainly support the uh, expansion of drilling opportunities. Uh, Mamdan Salameh, uh, your opinion on that question? Uh, I, I think w whether you are Republican or Democrat, or whether you contributed this or that, the question remains that oil is still an integral part of the U.S. and the global economy and will remain so for many years to come until we start to take measures to improve efficiency in the industrial, in, in industries as well as in uh, transport. Once we have done that, we need to move also on a big scale towards the electric cars. But having done that, we need also to go along with improving uh, renewable energy for electricity. However, I would say that renewable energy is uh, hyped a lot. In other words, there is a lot of exaggeration how much it can achieve. According to my research, even by the year 2030, renewable e energy will contribute 6 percent to the primary energy needs of the world. That will rise up to 13 percent in 2050. So uh, conventional oil and natural gas will remain with us, I would say, all through the 21st century. And I'm sure this subject will remain with us for a lot longer as well. Gentlemen, in Washington, Doha and London, thanks for joining me on this edition of Inside Story. And thank you for watching as well. We do appreciate your comments and suggestions for future programmes. Do uh, email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Sahil Rahman. Thanks very much for your time and your company.